Hello gamers and welcome to Game Warp. I'm Elwood. I'm Kim. And this is part two of our conference rundown from E3 2018. Um, E3 2018 has obviously wrapped up for another year and we're now obviously just looking back over what we've seen and as we said in the first part this has been a weighty conference this year with there's been so many more conferences to attend than there was in previous years and at the same time it seems to have doubled the amount of disappointment because we seem to have got into our heads that every conference was going to be this grand affair and unfortunately we had like Square which was disappointing uh, e EA surprisingly was very disappointing. I, and, you know, to uh, be to be fair, I wasn't really you know I never have high hopes for EA mostly because <laughs> you know EA is all about sports. I was actually pretty impressed that this time they strayed away from the sports, but still, I mean, it's a lot of repeat from last year. It didn't really change up that much. They gave us a lot of updates, nothing really that much new. So. Um. So obviously we're at the midway point and Ubisoft comes around. Now for myself, Ubisoft is always really exciting because Ubisoft is really sort of like, it's kind of like the party conference because it's always so much fun and Ubisoft always, no matter whether it's Asia Taylor hosting or if it's just the developers hosting, they always seem to find a fun way of presenting the material. It's not sort of like, here's 500 trailers and we're going to bombard them at once <laughs> or here's like, this game, and we're going to every minute sort of detail. Um, Ubisoft, they're just like, right off the bat, they're just like, we're going to be like the sunshine parade here. And it really sort of showed when they opened with this year's uh, Just Dance uh, dance Party, which I really love the uh, Panda Majorette. I think that was an absolute highlight of the conference. Never mind, <laughs> never mind just the Ubisoft presentation. Then um, Ubisoft, I felt, had a lot of interesting bits and pieces to show us. Um, I mean, I just want to obviously start with Trials Rising, and this was um, introduced by the creative director of Ubisoft Red Links, uh, Anissi Ivarreso, um, who I have to say makes me, it's got like the sort of accent that makes me want to like, having take some guided tours or just be the voice of my sat nav. <laughs> um, but seeing him turn up on a little moped and then destroy the stage was just, was just a fantastic introduction. Uh, the only downside to the trials was the, was it the Ubisoft superstars? Uh, these red shirt wearing folk who apparently are important to Ubisoft, but I couldn't figure out why. And one looked kind of like a squash BG, but um, are you excited for Trials Rising? Because the crash reel for myself was enough to make me interested in this game, just watching the unique ways you can maim yourself. Well, no, I mean, Trials, um, Trials, I mean, if you've been playing Fusion, you really get an idea of what Trials is. It's this, like, really challenging um, tracks, and it's like an everlasting playground because you can build your own <coughs> levels, and there's a lot of, like, right now a lot of people aren't playing, like, you know, the main levels. They're playing a lot of levels made by groups of people, and there are actual, you know, development companies that actually like groups that actually make a lot of the maps and they're really well done they have like really cool designs i actually watch um i watch what one one youtuber who specifically plays this and like plays it with with someone else um as like a competition uh ongoing kind of um videos uh playlist sort of thing and it's really fun to watch i mean i'm really bad at it uh, it gets me like, like I keep thinking I'm doing the right thing and I can never figure it out and what, what I'm doing wrong. And it's just like, it just gets me really frustrated, but it does have me really excited. I've always been like, ever since I played Trials Fusion the first, first time and sucked, I've always been like, I have to go back one time and find time. I'm going to sit down for like four hours. God knows where I'm going to find that and sit down for four hours and like, just figure it all out. Um, it's one of those games where it really challenges you. So you really want, like, it feels like a triumph when you win. So I really feel like when, like, Trials Rising will be another of those things. Obviously, like, you have to really be into uh, that sort of game to be into it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so many different things. It's like a racing game, 
meets a puzzle game, uh, meets just sheer insanity, really. It's it's a fun title, and it's nice to see that they find ever more unique ways to just keep that fun element to it. Um, the other thing that they were very keen to pro, uh, promote as well is the documentary on Rainbow Six Siege, Another Mindset. Uh, this is a documentary about e-gamers, which, you know... You either care about it or you don't. I personally don't really care. Um, yeah, well, you know, I mean... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you press buttons better than me. Yes, well, good for you. That's that's not an interesting documentary. And well, no, the I... The amount of jackasses we have to deal with in the esports community, I just really can't be bothered to watch a whole documentary well, of them. So. I don't know. I mean, I'd like to go into this a little bit more optimistic just because of the fact that, you know, a lot of it feels like it's it's a personal journey, right? For some of these people, it's finding they're they're taking a dramatic angle of like uh, people who have lost you know a, a career path that they wanted and finding something that works for them hey all the power to you if you're making money out of this and succeeding that's fine you know i i personally also don't care much for esports um i do you know we do cover dreamhack so uh being the representative that goes out for dreamhack montreal i i have gathered a little bit of interest so, I mean, obviously, I'm not much of a Rainbow Six Siege sir person, but it, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm more of the tamer games. There are, there are, you know, it is kind of fun to watch every once in a while. I'm not, I'm not the person, like, we're, we're both not first person shooter type of people, like multiplayer style. Um, so I, I guess this isn't really in the realm of what we like to see, but, um, but, at, I mean, if you're interested in the documentary and you're around for and it's supposed to be releasing at the six major Paris in August. Um, so that's something you can look out for if you're interested in that. Um, obviously, yeah. after this, there's all the big hitters. You know, we got um, another cinematic trailer from uh, Beyond Good and Evil 2, which kind of settled a lot of people probably on their mindsets. And we finally got Jade as we, we reveal that there's kind of like a dark Jade in the universe now. Um, yeah, there's a lot of critics who've just been handed a spoon. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say because all we heard going into going into Ubisoft and especially about Beyond Good and Evil 2 since we saw the trailer at last E3 was all these people sort of complaining the fact that it didn't have Paige, it didn't have Jade, it was nothing like the original game and it was just basically um, a name drop just to sort of cash in on it. And I think there are other titles that you can cash in better than Beyond Good and Evil. Um, and yes, from what we've seen, it's a darker title, but, um, I think there's some people eating a lot of humble pie right now because Jade turned up at the end, yeah. Paige is there, I'm just saying these characters are there, and yeah. this prequel, everything we see to go into it just seems to get more interesting and more sort of exciting, so, uh, yeah, I'm still excited. Yeah, well, hopefully next year it'll be, you know, it goes for a lot of the games that's been teased for a while now that... Hopefully by next year we'll be seeing something called gameplay instead of just cinematics. Because, I mean, be, I mean, the key thing is, you know, like, we, we have been seeing some gameplay. Uh, very, very early alpha of of Beyond Good and Evil. And it's kind of like, you know, they, they keep trying to update everybody on this stuff. Um, I mean, yeah. now that they, they've officially launched the Space Monkeys program, um, then that's really great. That means that, you know, a beta is probably in the making, um, alpha is in the making probably where it's going to have a lot more um, involvement with its fans, with, uh, you know, especially with the hit record, hit record. Um, we saw yeah. uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt there as well. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that we're seeing so much more of this, these, these movie actors actually coming in and getting into this gaming scene. Uh, I think it's a really nice pace as, you know, these are all entertainment forms, and to mesh them all together is, is really nice. Yeah, I think, I mean, whenever I see these cinematic trailers for Beyond Good and Evil 2, part of me kind of just wants to see a movie of it. Yeah. I, I'm less about the game. I just want to see them just do, like, a whole feature, because the animation is so nice, and these characters are so um, developed and, and interesting to look at. I mean, we've obviously got, like, the monkey thief. We've got... Uh, the hot chick with the fro, whose name I can't remember, but every time we get to introduce a new character, they always had this other element to the game, and it kind of makes me want to see it. As I said, just like 
a full length feature just in this anime itself. And, um, and it really works because of the genre that it's in, you know? I mean, if it retains some of like what, if, what the first game was, you know, you have kind of like this, this maybe you can have like a photographer and a thriller thing with a little bit of stealth. It's kind of like building another uh, female protagonist um, in a stealthy mode, you know? Uh, you know, I yeah. mean, I mean, <laughs> maybe, you know, we already got Red Sparrow lately, but I mean, like something in that genre, right? Like something kind of like a female version of uh, Mission Impossible style or something. And this, I don't know. And this, like, you know, it, it's nice. I would, I would, I would be down to watch that. Um, I mean, how do you feel about Hit Record? Because I keep hearing a lot of different things. A lot of people say that it's great because it's like this way of, getting your foot in the door into this sort of creative environment. A lot of people are saying, you know, it's essentially ripping off artists um, and getting them to do their work for free. And I think that I'm personally excited the opportunities to be involved in this because obviously looking for like artists, they're looking for voice work and people to do like uh, music and sort of radio singers and looking for writers. There's all these different elements that you can contribute to the game. If you go on the hip record site, there's a full list on there. And certainly the projects they've done in the past have all been really kind of interesting, the way that they've done them. Um, so, I, I mean, I personally think it's it's a great idea. And I think if you are doing it, you're kind of undoing it from the perspective of, oh, I'm doing this as a professional to be paid as a professional. I'm doing this because I want to be involved in this project and I have this particular skill set. I mean, that's the way I personally view it. Yeah, but... And you've gone into it aware of what, what's happening financially for you yeah you see like i mean i don't know hit record well enough to really say how i how well it works because i've never tried it before or um i've never really looked into it but i i think that you make a really good point the fact that everybody wants to be involved everybody it's all about letting the fans be a part of the development process. So it's kind of like you know they kind of take on that kind of indie side of things where they're making games for their fans and incorporating their ideas so everybody feels like they're a part of it. And, I mean, for me, I think it's a great idea. It's just like, you know, it's it's, it's kind of like Kickstarter. You know, people ask you to dish out money in advance to fund a project that you don't even know is going to succeed. At least this one, it's you're doing something for free, and then they'll probably credit you in some way for what you've done. So, I mean... Ubisoft is a big company. I know that, you know, people can spin the thing about, you know, oh, corporate giant's going to, like, all is out to steal your money and stuff and take advantage of you. But I think that it's it's a, it's, a, it's out of the goodness of their heart that they really do want to get the fans involved and make people, you know, at least this is a really smart move because if people feel involved in a project, they're going to play your game. They're going to be involved in it, and they're going to support it. And in all aspects, I think this is a very positive thing. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people obviously they get too involved in the background workings of the situation. It's all like, oh, Ubisoft have paid Hit Record um, X amount of dollars for their involvement in this project, and it's sort of like you can't concern yourself in the financial earnings of someone someone else. Um, they're essentially providing the platform for you to be involved in this, so you can't be concern yourself with this. You, I mean. At the end of the day, you either get involved or you don't. There's no one's like forcing you yeah. that you have to give up your your services. But, um, I mean, another exciting sort of uh, release we saw this, and this was one that we knew was going to be coming up going into it, and that would be the Division Two. Um, this one kind of has its legs broken from the start because of all the issues we had with the Division One, uh, where it was showing at E3 and. A lot of people complained about the differences between the gameplay and the graphical content, much like with Watch Dogs between the show, the showpiece and the actual game. Um, so while the cinematic trailer looks absolutely fantastic and there's a lot of people sort of doubting, is this going to be the quality of the game when it is released? Now, personally, I'm a huge fan of The Division. I thought it was a really great game. And moving the story now from the snow covered streets of New York to Washington and sort of taking back the capital uh, six months after the virus. So you're in this more urban environment where society is attempting to rebuild itself. So you've got like shanty towns and you've got like these militia units that are trying to restore order and peace here. And it's, I think it's really, it's a good evolution for the series. And I'm certainly excited. I liked what we saw. Um, and certainly with, 
with like raids and uh, eight player groups, I think it's gonna really add, a, add bring something new to the game. But I mean, I know this for yourself, Kim. This didn't make your top ten. So, what were your sort of feelings on the division? Do you not care at all? Oh no, I care. Um, it's just I played the division before. I do like it. Um, I didn't play as much as you did, obviously, because you know this was you you were handling this game for us, obviously. I do like the new scenario. I thought the cinematics were really good, but I also like as we go through the conference. You know, the point is that I saw other titles that I would most likely play. And, you know, as we always say, me and you, we are very different sort of gamers, and we do like different games, despite the fact that a lot of our reviews tend to be very, very similar. You know, it would be really, like, it would be, in, if we did a top 15 list, it would make it there. That's that's all I would okay. say. You know, it just kind of didn't make it because it was a game that I don't foresee myself playing, um, like, constantly. Uh, just because, you know, there are challenges to it that... Uh, I'm not really great at, so uh, I had a hard time with the division, not because it was flawed, but because of my own abilities, and that was the only reason, honestly. Um, I am I, I am looking forward to seeing what you think about it when this game releases, because I'm in uh, because you know I know you're going to play it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, and uh, if you're interested in the division two, it will launch on March 15, 2019. Uh, moving on to something I'm sure you're also very excited for is uh, if we owned a Nintendo Switch, you'd be all over it, is Mario XCOM has a DLC, the Donkey Kong Adventure. Mario XCOM, I mean, this is one of our big surprise hits of last year, and it, as we said at the time, this is going to be the game that makes you want to go out and buy a Switch. Um, I'm probably not going to hand over the money to buy a Switch and probably just get with my phone when my phone contract needs to be renewed. But um, certainly Mario XCOM is... or Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. Um, obviously, the Donkey Kong adventure sees you being able to control Donkey Kong. We did obviously get the rabbit version of Donkey Kong, and this time we do get the rabbit version of Cranky Kong, um, which is pretty cool. So you can control both Donkey Kong and this rabbit version playing essentially Cranky Kong. Um, the Again, the trailer shows there's a lot of fun. There's uh, some new powers to, to play around with there, and the end shot is just such a samurai shot. It was of uh, them uh, against the ocean backdrop. It uh, it all looks really cool. I mean, it's still as colourful and fun as it uh, it was with the original game. So I'm I'm excited to play this as much like the original game. So the another one that is uh, certainly a favourite of mine from last year, which has been now pushed to 2019, is Pirate Simulator Skull and Bones. Uh, we got to see some more of the gameplay. We, in particular, we got to see a lot of the customization options, um, such as the fact that you'd be able to like change things, such as like your weapon layout, the um, the statue you have on the front of your ship, and like even like the wheel of the ship itself. So there's a lot of really great customization. Certainly, the weather effects and the sea effects looked great, as we saw like waves crashing over the bow of the deck and. This is a game where the weather is going to affect mm -hmm. the environment and what's available to you, yeah. such as we yeah. saw that in good weather, you're going to have a lot more ships for you to loot, but at the same time, it's going to attract a lot of rival pirates. Mm -hmm. um, so you're always going to constantly be weighing up your options based on the environment and uh, your abilities of your crew. So for myself, this, I mean, this game only gets more exciting the more I see of it. And it's basically the best parts of uh, Black Flag but just put expanded into a full game, which is, I mean, who doesn't want to play that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that, I think that, yeah, for sure. I mean, Skull and Bones is a really cool idea. I, you know, <laughs> I mean, honestly, after Pirates of the Caribbean, who doesn't want to be a pirate? Um, I, I honestly, I'm looking forward to playing it. Uh, it seems like a really cool idea. I think the gameplay trailer really delivers on what they're trying to do. And I really like the angle that they're taking um, to focus it in the Indian Ocean. Uh, you know, with different stories that are based there. I believe I, I, I would assume if they do a single, I, I don't remember if there was a single player campaign, but if that was the case, I believe it's on the Indian Ocean. Um, obviously, moving on from Skull and Bones, uh, I was mentioning it before that uh, we have other actors making it on, and that's Elijah Wood. Obviously, Elijah Wood came back. Uh, last year, we got a cryptic teaser trailer, cinematics of sorts for Transference. And it was boasted as a VR game, and we kind of, like, 
pushed it to the side because we aren't quite interested in it. Um, now, obviously, the good news is that he came back. Now they have an actual trailer for it. Um, and it's working with uh, Elijah Wood's production company, Spectre Vision. Um, so they're taking uh, taking control of this kind of horror thriller game. Uh, it's kind of like a psychological thriller of sorts. Um, and it's going to be both VR and traditional platforms, which I'm very excited about. Oh, definitely. I think that they, I think they sort of realize that you can't if you can release it on a traditional platform as well as VR, then you're better off doing so because VR, they, while they continue to plug away at it, it hasn't really took off the way that they were expecting it to take off. And certainly when we were looking at transference, um, this is one that's going to probably appeal to like fans of Outlast as it is still very in sort of mystery what's going on in there. And I mean, I like Elijah Wood. I especially like his recent bout with independent horror. Um, which he's sort of like gone into, and this seems to really just be a further expansion of that. Um, I think, I mean, but then again, Elijah Wood, I think he's always one of those people I think would be really cool to hang out with. <laughs> See if Kim can lift him over his head or, or something. So. <laughs> I probably can. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he's such a he's a little small guy, yeah. isn't he? He's, he was surprisingly small. It's sort of like it's sort of, he's sort of like hello there, little man. <laughs> I'm not but that tall, um, so I don't know. But uh, I mean, I, I I don't mean any disrespect, but I probably can. <laughs> no, we don't. If if he wants to come and hang out with us, we will we will we should apologize and he can come out for us, and we'll take him for a drink and a wrestle or. <laughs> whatever so i have all kinds of respect for elijah wood okay he actually like i'm guessing it's some some community manager for him but they actually retweeted my review of like cooties back when it released in fantasia festival a few years back so i have immense amount of respect for someone like that <laughs> cool yeah so moving on, uh, there was a game that you really liked. Uh, I know it made your top ten. <laughs> I don't know if the final top ten will have it, but it's going to be Starlink yeah. Battle for Atlas, and I know you really like the Star Fox title. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, that's the whole reason Starlink Battle for Atlas made it into my top ten, is the fact that if you get this game on the Switch, you'll be able to play as Fox McCloud in his R-Wing. And that is just really exciting because we haven't had a good Lilac Wars title in a while, and this would inadvertently be <laughs> um, a Lilac Wars title if I'm playing as Fox McCloud in my own head. Um, this is one, I mean, obviously, this when this uh, was originally announced, it was that you were going to be able to buy the toys and then you would be able to like snap on weapons and it would like appear in the game. The problem we obviously have now is that the main supplier of these toys, which would have been Toys R Us, have now gone into uh, administration. And they were always the one which would obviously stock like all the um, all the sort of toys like Skylanders and uh, all these sort of games. Now, if we go to like Game Station or the sort of regular game stores, they have one or two, but they won't have the same sort of supply. And it makes me wonder how successful this game is going to be because it obviously relies so much on the toy aspect mm -hmm. now they have confirmed that you can play it play and complete it with the basic ship pack that you get in the game so that can tend to imply that you like can pick up power-ups in the game and and whatnot uh but yeah it's sort of whether this game is going to be a successful now it's sort of missing that key component of distribution for the toys it, it kind of all all up in the air but I mean, I was very excited. As soon as they mentioned it, it's sort of like, Fox, you get to play Fox McCloud if you buy the Switch. I was like, sold! <laughs> I'm going to go and buy this on the Switch. And um, it was really cool to see uh, Star Fox creator Shiro uh, Miyamoto being given the model of the model R-Wing as part of their presentation. And it kind of furthers that special relationship that Ubisoft and Nintendo have, uh, which obviously started last year with Kingdom Battle. Uh, which combined Mario and the Rabbids, and now they're doing the same. They're bringing uh, Fox McCloud into um, into this game, and you know it looks like a fun a fun little uh, shoot 'em up game. And uh, yeah, there's not a huge amount amount of those really. I mean, what Drifting Lands is sort of like the last one of note, would you say? Yeah, I mean, exactly. You know, yeah. Yeah, we we keep talking about how you know shoot 'em ups are 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 fairly, especially you know when you talk about like flying shoot 'em ups, like. 
<laughs> those are even rarer nowadays. Um, you know, I mean, so, you know, before we move on to some of the, the bigger titles that wrap up the show, um, we obviously got a update for For Honor, who's which has been doing really well because they have constant updates. They are in their fourth season or something now. Um, and I'm really impressed yeah. by it. I, I honestly, you know, obviously I have a bias because I am Chinese. So I have a bias that they added a uh, these uh, Chinese Wulin warriors um, as their new as their new faction and uh, as their new army and. I mean, I don't play a whole lot of For Honor, but I think they might have converted me. <laughs> it's, I mean, certainly a, it's a it's a fun game. The combat system is certainly unique for it, where you're constantly trying to find gaps and create defenses. Yeah. Uh, the single player I found left a lot to be desired, but certainly as a multiplayer game, it is a lot of fun. And I think when we look at the existing forces that we had, we had knights, samurai, and Vikings. And now we obviously have Chinese uh, warriors as well. It sort of perfectly complements as well because when we think of what other race could come in, um, you're kind of a bit limited as to what you could have. I mean, obviously we could do like Romans. We've already got the Centurion as a playable character there. So, I mean, the Romans obviously could come in uh, and as be another race. And they may still do. They may be like the fifth race that joins in this. Um but, I mean, certainly, I mean, as soon as they, we saw these character designs, it just instantly thought, oh, Disney Warriors has yeah. done a crossover here. But yeah. That's not a bad thing. Yeah, and, and I mean, um, at the same time, I mean, yeah, if you had a chance to get it on Uplay, it was for, they did offer for Honor for free um, on Uplay for PC gamers, which is pretty nice. I, I like, you know, I, as I keep saying, nice thing, uh, free things are always nice, and at these shows is when they should be dishing it out to try to get a lot more um, players involved. Uh, obviously, there was The Crew 2, which is releasing at the end of the month. We've already done our um, closed beta impressions of it. Um, you can check that out. Uh, I will link that at the description below, so we're not going to dwell on that one for too long. Um, the open beta is coming out on June 20, 21st, if you're interested in trying that out. And the game is ready for preload if you want to just you know, start it right away when it uh, becomes available. Um, so obviously the big title going in here that we were looking for, um, that had a lot of talk about is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, honestly, I was a little bit, I kind of got, you know, offset. I wasn't really, I didn't really know about it until I think the day before when you mentioned it to me, um, kind of snuck under the radar for me. And I was really surprised because I was, I didn't know that it was Ubisoft Quebec, uh, who made it, which is a fairly new studio. It seems like probably the moment they established that studio, this game was in development. Yeah, I mean, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, following on on from Assassin's Creed Origins uh, last year, we thought there may have been a bit more of a gap between Assassin's Creed titles, but they seem to come back to doing the yearly releases, so... Um, yeah, but see, that that's the thing, is that's why I was like, I was worried, and I was thinking, well, because Origins is made by Ubisoft Montreal, so this one is made by Quebec, which is a different studio, so it, it, it kind of, like, feels like they're, they've really, I guess that was why they emphasized that this game has already been in development for, like, three years. Yeah, and, and while we obviously get the feeling that it's rebooted the franchise with Origins uh, onwards, um, they have assured us they are slowly linking them back to the, the the games which came before it. So it is all going to eventually link together, and we are obviously starting to see key characters coming through here. Um, this time we're obviously moving to ancient Greece um, and sort of the golden age of Athens, and so you start as a simple mercenary, and you basically are taking on this whole odyssey that's going to be shaped by the choices and actions of your character. Uh, most exciting, really, is the fact that you can choose between either um, Alexos or Cassandra. So right from the start, you can be a female assassin, uh, which continues the ongoing, you know, this ongoing surge of uh, female fronted gaming, which is great to see. I mean, we obviously have the female soldiers in Battlefield Five, as we discussed already. Now you're getting to play female assassin straight off, and I mean. There was obviously with like uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, you can play as a female assassin in that, but you're also having to play as the brother as well. This is just straight up, you can just be the female assassin and mm -hmm. uh, play Cassandra and go take her on a path. And, and I think it's uh, it's, it's it's always exciting to see. So yeah, 
I agree. <laughs> I mean, I'm, just, I, I'm really looking forward to it. I feel like a lot of stuff is going to be coming out for Odyssey more and more. I mean, the the release date is surprisingly quick. It's going to be October 5th, 2018. I was I was pretty surprised at how quick it was going to come out. Um, so, I mean, that was the big show that ended. That was a big game that ended the showcase. I think Ubisoft did a really great job this year. Um Probably one of the best conferences, uh, one of the top conferences this year for me. I, it was fun, like you said. It was a lot of fun going in. All the games were top-notch quality, a lot of stuff to be excited about. Um, I, you know, I mean, it set this really great tone before we had to move into, um, uh, I mean, we had to move into the final press conference. Um, but, of course, before we move into PlayStation we do have the PC gaming show, which kind of took place in between in the afternoon on the very packed Monday, making sure that, you know, you didn't really have a time to breathe because PC gaming show slammed you with a lot of games, so many games. Um, so for PC gaming show, I think what we're going to do is uh, do highlights of what appealed to each of us. <laughs> I think that would be the sensible way to approach it. Yes. Um, I mean, this is, it is a stacked, stacked show and, I mean, with PC gaming, they said they were right from the start. I mean, the PC gaming show, for whatever reason, is often the, the least covered of the conferences. I know a lot of the other sites tend to just ignore it and focus on the main conferences, which is kind of a shame because there are some interesting ideas. And right from the start, as they're doing the intro buffer for this, they're saying, like, what appeals about PC gaming? And it's like the ability to mod. So you could put, like, the DBA costume from from overwatch into doom as we saw which is pretty cool in the opening credits and certainly this year there's some very interesting titles uh myself we obviously the standout we have like trusted park um world evolution which is basically zoo tycoon but with dinosaurs um and a game i'm really excited to uh, get my hands on when it eventually when it comes over to the consoles uh at the moment there is a pc release and the console release, while it is supposed to be out on both uh, Xbox and PlayStation, it doesn't seem to be shown on either marketplaces at the time of this recording. Um, but the game itself is really great. I mean, you obviously build your, your own Jurassic Park, and uh, you have to work in things such as legal fees when the dinosaurs inevitably escape. So it's uh, it's certainly an interesting title. Yeah, with Satisfactory, which is kind of, which I saw people in the uh, comment section calling No, Man, no Man's Land 2 Electric Boogaloo. But frankly, it's a lot deeper than that as you play a space engineer sent to a planet to gather resources and set up a factory for manufacture. And uh, just how this game builds and how you can team up with your friends to just build this huge factory and all like the conveyor belts and machines are all interlink. And when you just see how beautiful this all looks when you're creating these huge structures um, and you're creating new vehicles and you're collecting more resources and just how we're constantly building so um for the base builder and myself that really sort of appeals and just how it all links together this idea of manufacturing on a planet i just thought it was a really cool idea um and for myself it's really one of the highlights of the of this particular conference and this is ironic since it was the first thing that we got shown so yeah well i i definitely have some other highlights um i'm not much of a base building um gamer so I do play them every once in a while, not so much. But, uh, I mean, the ones that appeal to me, there's uh, The Sinking City by Frogwares, uh, which developed the Sherlock Holmes games. This one is feels incredibly like Sherlock Holmes just because, you know, it's also an investigation. It's an open-world, third-person Lovecraftian action investigation, which is um, no hand-holding, very uh, it's set in a fictional city, dystopia, and you kind of, like... Um, they uh, they focus on the fact that you craft the story around you pretty much. You figure out the investigation yourself by doing the general thing. You in interrogate people and inspect what you find, gather information, find clues, and these things will all lead to the next thing in um, the you know where you're gonna go next. And there's also of course if the game like this wasn't hard enough with no hand holding, they added a sanity factor to it to just screw you over even more. Um, I mean, the game could turn out, if they don't find the right balance, to be a real pain in the ass. But <clears throat> we can only see, like, we can only wait to see what happens because there was only a cinematic trailer. Um, as usual, obviously, another highlight is Raw Fury, which is, you know, kicking some serious behind this year with, like, 
two trailers, Raw Fury, I mean, they've done really great work. Uh, we covered Kathy Rain. <laughs> Um, previously, yeah. and we had a really great time with it. Um, I would have really loved to see some more footage from last year's big announcement, which was the last night. Apparently, that's kind of fallen into a ditch, and I don't know what happened to it. But at least this time, we have another night. We call it the Night Call. Um, it looks very interesting, black and white, very stylistic, um, along with uh, Sable, which is another game they're working on, uh, which is uh, is supposed to be reminiscent of uh, French and Belgium uh, comics, along with um, Studio Ghibli. So, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how that game turns out. Uh, it looks really nice, and, I mean, just for the hell of it, I also thought Maneater was really funny. Uh, I don't know I don't know if I'd ever sit down to play a game where I get to be a shark um, in a shark RPG-style game and just do a reverse psychology in this open-world thing. Um, I'm not exactly sure I'm down for that yet. Uh, it seems a little weird, but it, it sounds like a silly experience, just like, you know, Two Point Hospital, which is also one, um, which was, it's kind of like a spiritual successor of Theme Hospital with all these weird illnesses, like Turtle Head or something, and, um, I don't know, there's a lot of silly games coming out, uh, obviously there was a lot of Battle Royale style games as well, um, seems like that's the formula that everybody really likes, there's Realm Royale that's currently available for, think it's for free, I don't know, um, you know, obviously there's, um, there's, uh, Mavericks Pro Proving Grounds, and, uh, there was the Cyan Cyanide and Happiness one, which was, uh, Rapture Rejects, which is the one I would most probably play if I had a chance, because it just looks so cute, and it's like a top-down, um, I don't like top-down, but, it seems like a top-down battle royale sounds like a cool idea. Uh, I mean, generally, it's you know, we had some things, uh, some really general news. We had a roundup of um, Sega games, which is like games that have already been released, but now they're releasing on PC. Uh, we had a bunch of space games. We had a DLC for Don't Starve called Hamlet. Um, I guess the next big one we could talk about would be uh, The Two Walking Deads. There's Overkill's The Walking Dead, and obviously Telltale is in their final season, and they're doing The Walking Dead with, finally, some improvements in their combat. I mean, I played the first chapter of the first game uh, for The Walking Dead series, and I think, I mean, just The Walking Dead generally, I've just tuned out a bit uh, at this point, so nothing really sort of a stuff for myself. I mean, the biggest surprise really of the PC gaming uh show was the fact that they chose this show as the one that they were going to premiere a Hitman 2. Yeah. Um, now, it remains to be seen whether we're going to get any exciting contracts such as the ability to assassinate Gary Busey. Um, that remains to be seen at the moment, but uh, certainly we from the trailer we saw, it's uh, some new tricks, some interesting new environments including Miami. Um, so, yeah, it'd be, I think Fans of uh, the previous uh, Hitman reboot are going to certainly get to, uh, a kick out of this one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, th I think, you know, the PC game covered a lot of stuff. Uh, we just really hit the tip of the iceberg and did a really quick recap of the games that were shown here. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just impossible to cover everything. Uh, you know, there's a lot of multiplayer games, a lot of games that are already out, a lot of additions, um, a lot of DLCs, that sort of stuff. Um, so if you're interested, you can check in the description below. We're going to give it, we're going to have all the links of all the full recaps that we have. Um, obviously in this impressions, we're only looking at mostly games that, you know, uh, appeal to us more than others. Um, so moving on, I mean, we're going on for the big show. Usually people anticipate this the most. And that's, uh, especially if you're a PlayStation owner, that is the Sony conference, um, which was pretty much the end of the press conferences every single year. Uh, they kind of said that they were going to change their formula. They're going to focus a lot on um, the big four games that they're looking at, which is The Last of Us Part Two, Ghost of Tsushima, uh, Death Stranding, and Spider-Man. Um, obviously, yeah. Yeah, obviously, other than that, we, we still got other games uh, that we got to see. Uh, but I, I like the new structure. It was really weird that they started in one venue and then ended up in another one with some random break in the in between. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really bizarre the fact that we opened with uh, The Last of Us 2 trailer with Naughty Dog once again showing their politics, wearing their politics on their sleeve as we got to see 
an intimate moment um, between two female characters before we went into the gameplay, and this clearly Naughty Dog do not have anything, uh, any qualms about sticking it to Trump's America, um, as they always worn their politics on their sleeve, and here it doesn't seem to be changed. And certainly having this romantic uh, angle and then going to this really tense sort of stealth gameplay was a really great way mm-hmm. to showcase the uh, the game itself. I mean, it looks absolutely stunning um, already. I mean, obviously now it's working with the power of the PS4, so there's a lot more freedom when it comes to obviously the gameplay and what they can do, but just seeing uh, sort of like sneaking around the woods and like doing these stealth attacks on uh, enemies and seeing how enemies reacted. Um, there was moments where it seemed to like switch between cutscenes and gameplay and there was no sort of like noticeable um, jarring between the two and it, it I'm very excited to uh, to play it. I mean, I've still got to finish the, the first game. Um, <laughs> yeah. But there's just so much to play yeah. at the minute. This is the thing. It's, it's, I mean, The Last of Us is widely acclaimed and i think that it's great obviously with the last uh the last of us part two that it's going to continue the story that established in the first game and i'm very excited and any time we have something from naughty dog it's always exciting to see be it uncharted or let's say be it on last last of us um naughty dog have constantly been this studio that matches to produce interesting and exciting games and yeah. certainly seems to be the case with this one so yeah I, I, I was very impressed by The Last of Us. Um, I mean, I've only watched the first game. I haven't really started playing it, so I know a lot about the game. Um, I am really interested in this one. Uh, it, it definitely looked really great. Um, everything you said was fantastic. Like, it's, it's, it's really a game that's... I mean, for fans that love The Last of Us, I think that, you know, there's enough to be just really a lot to be excited about. But, I mean, I think the title that got me even more excited, I think what happened is that the show really kind of pushed forward, and I think the game that I kind of brushed aside back at the uh, Paris uh, Paris Gaming Week or whatever last year was Ghost of Tsushima when it got announced. And now we have, like, this entire gameplay debut, and it is stunning, like, you cannot tell that it is a game. It feels like it's, like, this real landscape, especially when they that when the game started and then you move into this area where it's just these um, maple leaves all over the floor, and it's just amazing. I mean, there's also that kind of, like, um, Tomb Raider kind of style where you, you have these combat motions, but there's also, like, kind of slower bits and stuff like that for uh, slow motion, I guess, to probably help you react a little faster since, you know, it... It, it you know it's it's really amazing i i really really think um it's going to be a fantastic game yeah it certainly looks uh looks fantastic we obviously looking at this samurai who becomes a ninja um and brought back uh, certainly echoes of tenshu certainly when we're looking at the self uh segments there when you look at the the actual uh, fight mechanics as well. They also look fantastic as well. And so yeah, I mean, because um, I think it's a really, it's certainly an exciting title. I mean, we had another um, sort of a ninja title as well. I mean, we had, I mean, we had several uh, sort of ninja titles. Yeah, we got Neo Two, which, um, which is uh, which doesn't have a release date, just really a teaser trailer, just announcing, yay, we're doing this, you know. Um, I like Neo. I thought Neo, the first game, was uh, a tough Souls-like game, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> but it, you know, it had a lot of fans. A lot of people really did love it. Um, you know, obviously, as you go into this further, we we also got uh, more uh, kind of like a cinematic gameplay blend of Death Stranding, and now we see that. There are other names, other actresses uh, connected to this title now. Uh, Lea Seydoux and um, and Lindsay Wagner has been involved, is also now involved in the project. We're finally seeing a little bit more of Norman Reedus's character Sam and what his role is in this, and kind of like the world that it's built. Uh, I, I, it's still you know, it's still very vague. We still don't really know what's going on, but I think the clues are coming in now. It's starting to become intriguing to see where this is going to be next. Hopefully by PlayStation Experience we'll be able to get a little bit more details into what's happening. I mean, 
what do you think right now of like the cinematics and kind of like a bit of gameplay that we saw? Yeah, I mean, the gameplay, I mean, it's obviously bringing back echoes of, like, Metal Gear Solid Five and the fact that this is an open-world game, and, I mean, it's hard to say what sort of game that we're going to be playing at the moment, since all we saw, basically, was Sam delivering uh, puzzles across this sort of uh, very sort of abandoned sort of landscape. Uh, we seem to get more of a hint of what the fetuses will play into this, as they... Um, and when they're connected to these scanners, which enable uh, Sam to be able to see these monsters that are basically invisible to the human eye and uh, lurking the lurk in the environment. I mean, we obviously saw bits and pieces of what they could do. Um, I think it was in Paris that we saw a bit more there, and it showed that when they grab hold of people, they age them mm -hmm. rapidly. So every trailer we get, there are new interesting little elements and it's fun putting it all together I mean we still obviously have to see how um, uh, Mads Mikkelsen's character is going to play into all of this mm -hmm. uh, as he was when we saw him he was very much sort of like seemed like the very evil sort of military sort of character yeah. um, and everything that we've seen obviously with Norm Reedus's character has been obviously out in sort of like the wilderness um so how these two characters are going to interact what the link between them is going to be mm -hmm. is yet to be revealed and as always i'm i'm excited i mean yeah. kojima is clearly no has a plan for what he's doing and at the moment he seems to be having fun playing around with weirdness and uh, <laughs> keeping us all guessing what it's going to be about yeah i mean it, it definitely looks like you know death stranding is heading into this like uh toxic environment to say the least i mean we had the hints of like the rain kind of like rush uh, shriveling his skin a little and having some sort of odd effects so i think the environment has something to do with it uh so yeah that's death stranding is definitely a title i'm still excited about uh but i really hope that you know Everything doesn't have a release date so far. <laughs> it's feeling a little <laughs> frustrating. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, in, in this coming conferences this year, we're going to see a lot more uh, release dates and just updates in general so that it's not just a waiting game for everything. Um, so before we head to the fourth big, uh, fourth big title that PlayStation covered, uh, we also got a DLC for Destiny 2 called Forsaken. Um, we got a new Remedy title called Control. Uh, there was no gameplay uh, for the trailer that they announced, but there has been game tra that, uh, gameplay trailers that have been released afterwards. They've talked about it on uh, some of the live streams. At the same time, uh, obviously, another big title to be released was uh, Resident Evil 2 Remake, which was really impressive. They did a really nice cinematic to start it, and it looks really, really promising. Um, I, I, I've never played Resident Evil 2, and the remake looks so great that I really want to head back into it. And you can play Leon, and you can play Claire Redfield, and, you know, head back into Raccoon City and shoot up some zombies. <laughs> it sounds like a good time. Um, that's actually coming relatively soon. Uh, well, not soon enough, but January 25th, 2019. Um, and obviously we got, uh, from the co-developers of Rick and Morty, we also got Trover Saves the Universe. This was this odd weirdly weirdly humorous sort of uh, game that's coming up for PS4, PSVR. Uh, we got a Pirates of the Caribbean um, trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3. Um, and obviously, with that said, we're moving into the final title of PlayStation, which is Marvel's Spider-Man. So last year we saw a lot of Batman Arkham kind of thing. We got a scene. Um, this year we're getting kind of like uh, the villains and like a bigger fleshed out version of it. It's certainly a lot to be excited for with it, with with the PlayStation X experience. I mean, there was there was so many interesting games here, and it certainly shows that PlayStation, much like Microsoft, are uh, very keen to establish their their position within the games market as the two main players here. I mean, when you only have to look at the Nintendo Treehouse to see how they're phoning it in, <laughs> um, to see how they're not really a contender in this in this fight. It's really just between Microsoft and PlayStation. Um, I love the fact that uh, PlayStation, uh, Microsoft actually stole one of PlayStation tricks by making it <laughs> dropped by dropping leaves on the audience uh, because we know PlayStation love to bombard their audience with smoke and 
effects. So never sit in the front three rows of a PlayStation. <laughs> well, this year wasn't that bad. This year was really just uh, musical performances, um, which was which was nice. It was uh, it was a nice change of pace. I think they dialed it down a little. The venue was a little smaller than usual, probably. Um, at least that's what I I saw from the streams. Obviously, we're not on location. Oh my God, the. But do we really need to play musical chairs to, for one trailer? <laughs> they they had to uh, they had to emphasize. Now you understood why they were under a tent in like this rustic looking place. It was to enforce the the Last of Us effect. Not that the trailer wasn't effective enough, right? And um, we have these musical indents between trailers that made no sense. You'd have these random little characters turn up and they would play like chopsticks and the piano or, or whatnot, and you think. Oh, they're all gonna they're gonna play into some like big release and no, no idea. <laughs> For PlayStation? Yeah, this was PlayStation. Yeah, it was on the main screen. You had like the little morphy creatures appear. <laughs> okay, I thought you were actually talking about the musicians. I was like, no, <laughs> but some of them are actual no, composers. No. <laughs> they're actual composers. <laughs> Let's move into Nintendo, which is a, gonna be a really quick one. There were, you know, obviously a lot of huge titles. They gave like a I don't know, 50 titles that were from uh, upcoming games and stuff like that. Uh, but I think one of the main focuses um, was, uh, I mean, we were really excited. We had seen it before was uh, the Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, uh, which is super cute. And it introduces a controller that you can use and you can pocket your little, uh, your Mewtwo in your pocket and take him along with you. Uh, for a ride, and it's going to be compatible where everything on your mobile po- Pokemon Go can go into your Nintendo Switch and so on and so forth. Um, but I mean, I think one of the bigger titles was Super Mario Party, because this one really shows that, you know, multiple people with Switches is going to be able to, you know, make different levels and screens and stuff like that and enforce that party spirit. Oh, yeah. I mean, Mario Party has been a long time coming for the Nintendo Switch. I mean, Nintendo Switch has a good wing for when it comes to party games, I think, really, since its release. Uh, we were like, what was it, one, two, three, click? Um, they, I mean, even if you go back to, like, the, the Wii, um, it had a, a great range of party games. And I think it's great to obviously see Super Mario uh, Party on there. I mean, the other obvious exciting one that everyone was hoping for and did get revealed was Super Smash Brothers. Um Boasting probably one of the largest rosters to date. Um, I mean, do we even really need to say why Why to uh, look at Super Smash Bros.? I mean, I think people will know what to mm-hmm. expect from it already. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the exciting thing now is that, you know, they have the return of the eight-player ba- battles. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, the extensive roster is because of the fact that they've incorporated um, the previous games, uh, the whole cast of the previous games, I believe, into this one uh, with a few, you know, new ones as well. Uh, I can't remember which are the exact new ones anymore. Uh, but this one's coming out fairly soon, December 7th, 2018. A couple of titles are still outstanding from the Nintendo, which I don't know what's happened to them, like uh, Yoshi's Woolly Kingdom. Uh, doesn't seem to be getting either a release date nor a mention on this show. Um, Fortnite has finally landed on the Switch, um, meaning that which I think is another great title, I mean, it's a Battle Royale title, and of the Battle Royale titles that are currently out at the moment, I think it's certainly the most fun and easy to pick up, with its sort of cartoonish graphics, and the ability to build things on a whim, mm-hmm. uh, is always kind of fun, so, compared to when, like, the likes of Player Unknown Battleground, um, and, like, Mavericks, it's just a lot, it's a much lighter title, and I think it works perfectly with, with the Switch, really. So. You know, it, it, you know, I, like, a sidetrack on this is, like, how many people do you need in the world, in a multiplayer world? Like, people keep wanting to add more players. I mean, I don't have four hours to sit in, like, what, a thousand-person <laughs> playground. Like, that's crazy. That's it. Like, I, I already yeah, but felt yeah, like but... Battlefield had 60, what, 62 people? And th- those are already, like, what, 20-minute rounds? You know, you go to player, bat- uh, player Unknown's Battlegrounds is, like, 100 people, and we thought that was a big deal. <laughs> and then... Yeah, but at least I mean, we're we're playing. Uh, as I said, with these games, you can you tap out as soon as you die. Yeah. So it's not like you're waiting yeah, for a yeah, hundred yeah. people to die. Yeah, but true. Yeah, I think certainly Fortnite. It's ironic with Fortnite that people are downloading it for the battle royale mode, which is the free part, and not actually playing the main pay for part of the game, which is uh, 
kind of ironic it's took over, but at the same time it's created this horrible trend where now <sighs> so many games in our Battle Royale games we like heard that so obviously Star Wars is gonna have a, a Battle Royale section gonna be put into there. Uh, Black Ops four is just going to be Battle Royale and it's all like it's just well, Can we not pound something into the ground for a change? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you know, the thing is, it's going to run out of steam and we're going to move on to the next thing. And that's that's what's going to happen. Um, but I mean, before we end this recap, I guess what I want to talk about is there were a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, there was like a major amount of titles that are coming up for Nintendo Switch. And I felt like they really wanted to emphasize it by having this really long trailer so um, some of the highlights is that, you know, Crash Bandicoot and Sane Trilogy is making its way to Nintendo Switch on June 26th. Um, there's also Fallout Shelter, which is available now. Um, there's also uh, what I am really excited to see was um, if you haven't played it on Nintendo uh, DS before, The World Ends With You is a fantastic title. Um, it's a really cool R RPG, um, very musical, and um, the music is great, actually. It's very rockish and stuff like that. Uh, it's really cool. You should check that out. That's coming out in fall 2018. Um, just some of the quick titles that you know to go through. I was just about to say, I think with the, the Nintendo Switch, the sneaky thing they're doing is they're re-releasing all the, the Wii U titles mm -hmm. uh, onto the Switch when we look at Toad's Treasure Tracker, Bayonetta 2 is also uh, snuck on there, Xenoblade Chronicles. It's sort of like all these titles that were originally the Wii U are now sneaking across onto uh, the Switch, which you know is great because it means one less console I have to find a space for. <laughs> yeah. So, well, like, I mean, Nintendo Direct is kind of like was just a overload of games, and they it's always like that where they focus on one game. This year was Super Smash Bros. Um, with a long talk about you know what's involved and all that stuff. Uh, I, I'm, you know, Nintendo, I, I don't own a Switch. I don't intend on owning a Switch anytime soon. So I can get excited, but I know it's going to be, you know, not very fruitful anyways. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's our general, you know, we looked at uh, Ubisoft, uh, PC Gaming Show, PlayStation, and Nintendo. I think that it's pretty much time to wrap it up. Uh, I mean, what are your overall impressions of the conference? Yeah, I mean, E3 is always the highlight of our of our year. I mean, it's insane to to do it, but at the same time, it's always such a fun occasion, the amount of things that we get to see and, and do uh, through E3. And yeah, I think this year there was several conferences which certainly dropped the ball. Um, as I mentioned already, EA wasn't great. Square wasn't great. Nintendo, as is to be expected, phoned it in, and uh, Bethesda... was mid-range. <laughs> mid-range. I, I... I mean, it wasn't very middle of the road, and uh, as, as I said, I think Bethesda, you've got to stop trying to focus on your crowd if they're not interacting, because looking at people bored and <laughs> annoyed that you're interrupting the conversation isn't really adding to uh, yeah. a gaming conference. Yeah, but, you know, I, I, I still defend the fact that I think that Bethesda had a lot of really exciting things. As I think more about it, I actually thought Bethesda had quite a few titles that were pretty interesting. Um, obviously, like, Microsoft and PlayStation, um, they delivered. Uh, Ubisoft, as I said before, are very impressive. I, you know, I honestly think um, PlayStation, I mean, those three did really well. Um, I think that there was a lot to look forward to for any of those things. Whether it's an exciting time to be a PlayStation owner, we always say that. But you know, this year I can actually say that it's a really exciting time to be an Xbox owner too. There's a lot of cool titles coming out that um, I'm actually really happy that I upgraded to a Windows 10. <laughs> With that said, uh, this wraps up our E3 impressions, uh, the part two E3 impressions. Um, in the link below, you're going to be able to find um, all of our recaps for Ubisoft, PlayStation, Nintendo, PC gaming show. Our write-ups, uh, you'll see all the full recap on there. Uh, including games that we excluded, obviously, from this chat. Uh, there's also going to be the part one impressions if you missed it. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoy the show, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Head over to our home base, thatmomentin.com, to read gaming reviews. You can check out gaming news over on our Facebook and our Twitter, at Game Warp Podcast. Uh, you can check out, uh, obviously, we have gaming obsessions and... Um, little snack bits and stuff like that, gaming snacks that we talk about, uh, over on Instagram, instagram.com slash gamewarepodcast, and um, keep your eyes peeled on our stream, because when we do stream, it's at twitch.tv slash gamewarepodcast. Till next time, bye!